Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Dave Webb. I'm convener of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And thank you for joining us on this webinar on linking militarized space and climate crisis. And this is uh, one of the first events of Keep Space for Peace Week. Um, and in 1999, the United Nations General Assembly declared the 4th to 10th October as World Space Week to celebrate the contributions of space science and technology to the betterment of the human condition. And the Global Network has been calling for several years now for global actions and events during this week to keep space for peace. Because of the pandemic, however, uh, most of these events are being held online this year, but not all of them. And you can see a list of those things that are happening uh, that we've been notified about from our website, which is wwwspace 4 peaceorg So thanks again. Um, I'll just... Tonight we have um, three speakers and uh, a moderator for questions and answers at the end. So we're going to have three speeches. First of all, uh, I'll introduce each one. There are Regina Hagen from Germany will speak on European expansion into space. Then Stuart Parkinson from the UK will speak on the climatic impacts of space flight. And Dieter Engels from Germany will speak on the impact of large satellite constellations on astronomical observations. So I think we can start with Regina Hagen. Regina is uh, on the board of the Global Network. She's interested in the links between nuclear weapons, missile defenses, and space use, and worries about the effects both on Earth and in space. So over to you, Regina. Dave, did you not want to start with your own video presentation? You're right. How could I forget that? Sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, this is a short video. Um, to introduce some of the aspects of the, of the problems that we're concerned with. Since humans first looked up at the night sky in wonder, space has been a mystery and an inspiration. Seeking to connect with the heavens, Star patterns were identified to reflect myths and legends. Some of the stars were seen to move slowly over the background and were called wanderers or planets. From observing, cataloguing and measuring the stars and closely examining the light from them, amazing discoveries have been made and theories developed about how stars shine, how they are born and how they may eventually die and the human connection with them was finally uncovered. The elements from which the Earth and all life are formed are actually made in the stars and spread out when the star explodes at its life end. To get closer and uncover more wonders, space probes were launched to explore the solar system. And now satellite systems have been developed to help study the Earth's environment and help understand the weather and climate change and to monitor such things as the effects of pollution and agricultural patterns. Other systems are helping with communications and a whole range of human activities. The importance of outer space to all humankind was recognised very early on in the development of space travel and was the reason that the Outer Space Treaty on principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, was developed, agreed and signed at the United Nations in 1967. The treaty recognises outer space as a global commons. And it states that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all humankind. However, the dependency on space and the rapid development of space technologies are running out of control. We are experiencing a tragedy of the commons, 
where major users with open access to space and who are unconcerned about any rules that govern access and use are acting according to their own self-interests and contrary to the common good of all. While some seek to explore and explain, others look to exploit and dominate. Billionaires and their corporations are seeking to exploit space, while the military wants to dominate and control the ultimate military high ground. The launching of rockets is also producing environmental problems, polluting the ground with fuel and exhaust fumes. The increased in activity in space is creating huge amounts of debris that could even eventually prevent spacecraft from leaving the Earth altogether. The passage of rockets through the atmosphere could also be affecting the ozone layer and the huge increase in rocket launches is setting up big problems for the future. Space corporations also plan to establish networks of thousands of satellites to provide superfast 5G networks for global broadband coverage that will also have military applications for communications and will increase surveillance and targeting capabilities. The number of satellites in orbit is set to grow rapidly and will hamper astronomers and dramatically change the night sky. In addition, accidents do happen and when they do at launch then a considerable amount of environmental destruction and contamination follows. The increase in satellite launches is accompanied by also an increase in places to launch from. New spaceports are being established around the world and their construction is often opposed by local residents concerned about the effects on their environment and the destruction of local ecologies. Nuclear power in space is also being promoted once again. But ge nuclear generators for planetary bases or for rocket propulsion create environmental problems, from the mining of the uranium to deployment on spacecraft or celestial bodies. And what if there was an accident at launch that could spread deadly nuclear materials far and wide? Interest in the development of nukes in space is perhaps more to do with being able to power space weapons. Establishing bases or even landing on celestial bodies can also bring contamination by dangerous substances or bacteria, just as Europeans brought sickness to the New World. And now the moons and planets of our solar system are on the verge of being exploited by mining corporations. In 2015, President Obama signed the so-called Space Law, approved by the US Congress to allow US companies to exploit space mining and the appropriation of asteroids and other space resources. Mining activities in space would produce waste deposits on celestial bodies or aggravate environmental problems on Earth and perpetuate the wasteful use of resources. So, what we do in space and whether we exploit or explore relies on a few people making the right choices and it's up to us to ensure that they do. Join us and the many others around the world who are doing what they can to keep space for peace. Okay, thanks very much for reminding me about that, Regina. <laughs> so um, now it is over, hang on, just admit somebody else. And now it is over to you, Regina. Yeah, thank you uh, for joining us on this Sunday evening, at least evening German time uh, for this discussion and talk. I'm not so, uh, effective in producing slides as Dave is, but I will do my best. Um, my um, subject is uh, <clears throat> how Europe expands into space. Uh, and it is a very wide field because uh, Europe obviously has many countries, uh, has many organizational entities. Um, so I decided uh, to 
limit this talk on um, actually European organizations uh, and European space endeavors uh, and not touch on national ones, although there are many to various degrees uh, in a military uh, respect. Um, but I'll, I'll limit to the European ones. In Europe, <clears throat> we have the European Union, but not all countries in Europe are members to the European Union. Examples of non-members are, for example, Norway or Switzerland. Um, within Europe, we have the European Union, and I will come to the ones I show you here on this slide. We have the European Union, we have a European Space Agency, and then we have, which sounds weird at first, but I'll explain why, the European Agency for, for the Space Program. And then in addition, we have a European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, uh, the European Meteor Meteorological Satellite Organization. And by the way, I live in Darmstadt, Germany, that is close to Frankfurt am Main. And the operation center of uh, the European Space Agency, as well as the whole of the Meteorological uh, European Satellite Organization, are actually located in Darmstadt. I'm having a problem of getting this slideshow to move. Ah, no. Um, so I'll start with the European Space Agency, which used to be the only space agency we had in Europe. Uh, it's several decades old. It was established in 1975 <clears throat> and explicitly is not an agency of the European Union. You will hear later why I uh, stress this fact. Some members of the European Space Agency are not members to the European Union. Like Britain, they exited from, uh, from uh, the European Union earlier this year, but also Norway or Switzerland. There is a convention for the establishment of the European Space Agency dating back to 1975 which in Article 2, the purpose of the uh, European Space Agency, explicitly points out that the European Space Agency is exclusively for peaceful purposes, which created more of a problem in the context of the uh, development of the European Union, um, because it restricted um, space use, through the European Space Agency to peaceful purposes, to non-military purposes. And the European Space Agency did not strictly adhere to that, um, but it was sort of impossible for uh, the European Space Agency to um, enter into specifically uh, military projects. Another of the agencies is for the meteorological satellites. And here for it also, not all the member states, 30 of them, are uh, members of the European Union, in addition uh, to the ones I mentioned before for uh, the European Space Agency. In the case of the meteorological satellite organization, for example, it's also Turkey. Um, the tasks or the mission of the meteorological satellite organization is weather forecast they do long-term measurements from space which is really very useful now when it comes to monitoring of the climate change because they do have uh, data um, that, uh, that go a long long way back so that you can compare data they have been collecting in the past decades with data now um, the European Meteorological Satellite Agency does not um, 
um, do specifically military projects, but the data they provide can be used by the military. For example, when they do out of the area missions, uh, they can uh, they can uh, rely on weather forecasts and weather data provided by the European Meteor Meteorological Satellite Organization, which can be important. For example, when you are in muddy ground uh, and there is very rainy weather forecast, you might not want to go in um, in that area with tanks because they would get stuck. So uh, there is military use but they don't have a military purpose, a dedicated military purpose. Now, the European Union um, originally was founded also as a civilian organization, um, originally for economic reasons, as an economic union. Um, and over the past 20 years, the European Union as such um, has um, developed a mission for security, meaning military security, defense security. Um, and um, in its space strategy um, released in 2016, the European Council, which is one of the bodies of the European Union, specifically recognizes that space technology and derived services contribute to providing solutions to security challenges and acknowledges the need for stronger synergies to be pursued between the civilian and military use of space assets. And that's another theme that has appeared in the past years. Um, especially when it comes to space, um, that dual use uh, is exploited, meaning uh, civilian satellites and civilian data or data collected for civilian purposes are used for military purposes. And the European Union made that an official strategy and policy. And that is new, and this is the reason why the European Space Agency, which is restricted to peaceful purposes, could not be used as an agency for the European Union, which had been discussed for a while, but it simply became impossible with the, with the stronger focus of the European Union on, on security issues, military issues, strategy issues. So this year, less than half a year ago, um, within the context of the European Union, um, this European Union Agency for Space was established. Um, the acronym is USPA. I hope this is the correct English pronunciation. And it's interesting to see which of the directorates of the European Union is responsible for this new agency. Namely, it's the Directorate for the Defense Industry and Space. That's the name of the, of the uh, Directorate. And I think this is very telling. Um, it is a European Union regulation, which establishes this new agency, which points out in its second paragraph, the policy possibilities that space offers for the security of the Union and its member states should be exploited as referred to in particular in the global strategy for the European Union's foreign and security policy. So here we see again that this new agency for the space program of the European Union has a very strong mission and focus on uh, military purposes. Um, its mission is very closely connected with Galileo and EGNOS, and Galileo is the European satellite navigation system uh, with up to 24 satellites in a medium Earth orbit for navigation and, uh, and, and timing services. EGNOS is an overlay um, using general navigation system 
but also uh, Copernicus plays a very important role, which is an Earth observation system and originally was also meant to be for civilian purposes and now has its own um, security dimension. Um, another uh, system um, that has been developed or is being developed uh, under the roof of the European Union for which this new space agency uh, is responsible is GovSatCon, which is the governmental satellite communication system, which is also a new development. But then in the past, the European Union as such was not involved in military missions. If they want to be independent for doing their own military uh, operations, they of course need their own independent satellite communication system and governmental means that it's very secure and that not everyone can use it. Um, and this is specifically the, the new space agency's um, task is specifically to support the strategic interests of the union, but also, and uh, this connects to what uh, Dave told in his um, presentation, but these many startups, the new space, the many uh, partly privately run spaceports and and uh, and space launchers. Um, this new agency is specifically tasked with uh, supporting uh, this development. When we come back to Galileo, the navigation uh, system um, set up by the European Union, um, this has a specific public regulated service, which is restricted for authorized users, uh, which could be fire brigades and the police, uh, but in specific, specifically are also uh, military users. Um, with Copernicus, which uh, originally was planned as a civilian service, we also see that there is something called the Copernicus service in support to European Union external action. And external action is not limited to foreign policy, but also to external military activities. And I want to point out that one um, important aspect is of this is border uh, surveillance and they say the fight against illegal trafficking which means uh, prevention of refugees from the middle east or from africa to cross the mediterranean or uh, land borders into the european union uh, and keep them away so coponicus is also used in particular by frontex which is the European Border and Coast Guard Agency to prevent refugees from entering the European Union and asking for asylum here. Um, which is the task of Frontex, but was never meant to be the task of Copernicus in the beginning. Um, to complete the picture of the European Union, uh, it also has a satellite center which existed has existed quite a long time and originally was established as the satellite center for the western european union which was sort of a military arm which no longer exists because the european union as such now has its common foreign and security policy um, they are located in madrid in spain um, i think i'll stop here um, and with this meant to give you a brief glimpse uh, into what's happening here in Europe, which might not be seem uh, at the first few very relevant when you compare it with what the United States or Russia or China are doing. But I think it shows that um, everywhere, the militarization of all aspects of life, including space use are increasing. Uh, and it seems like we are uh, uh, fighting against real giant when we want to keep and preserve space for peaceful purposes. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Regina. Um, there'll be time for questions uh, at the end when all three speakers have uh, spoken. So next speaker is Stuart Parkinson, who will speak on the climatic impacts of space flight. Um, Dr. Stuart Parkinson is Executive Director of Scientists for Global Responsibility, a UK-based membership organisation promoting science and technology that contributes to peace and social justice and environmental sustainability. He holds a PhD in climate physics, is a former expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and has a long-standing interest in outer space. Well, thanks uh, very much for coming, Stuart. It's over to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to the Global Network for inviting me to speak. Um, I've got a few slides too, so I will just um, put these up. Start my slideshow. Um, hopefully, will work soon. There we go. Right. OK. Yes. As Dave said, I'm going to talk about the climatic impacts of spaceflight. So uh, I'll start with a few basics, but I think they've been covered adequately already by um, Dave's um, video. And, and just reflecting on the main aims of, of spaceflight, um, both robotic missions and human missions. And um, I'm in particular asking the question, what is essential? What, what do we really need? Um, when we're thinking about the climate emergency. Um, so, yes, we, we've got things like telecommunications, very useful, monitoring of Earth's environment, um, military purposes, much more controversial. Um, and th those are mainly um, provided by robotic space missions. When it comes to human space missions, um, the aims are a bit more esoteric, a bit, a bit less well-defined, broadly based research, space exploration, public relations for science, tourism. And the, the benefits of those are, are, are much more questionable. So um, when considering climate issues, we, we need to think about what is essential, um, particularly because spaceflight is very energy intensive per launch. You know, we, we know that rockets use a lot of energy, um, especially if they have heavy payloads, and, and that includes humans, and uh, particularly if they're, they're um, carrying out long distance missions, so going to other planets, for example. Um, the carbon emissions per tonne of rocket fuel is generally high, it's higher than petrol that, that people put in their cars, for example, um, and some rocket fuels are, are very high. So, for example, liquid hydrogen it has six times the carbon emissions um, per tonne um, than petrol and gasoline. And that's largely because you have to keep it at a, you produce it and keep it at a very low temperature. It, um, liquid hydrogen exists below 250 degrees centigrade. So um, it's a lot of energy to keep that temperature, to maintain that temperature. Um, you've also got additional heating effects um, that contribute to climate change when you have emissions in the stratosphere. So um, particularly things like water vapour, um, which is emitted when, when you um, burn fuel and black carbon, certain types of, of fuel release black carbon, which um, has a warming effect as well. So to minimise the climate impacts, you need to minimise the number of launches and the weight of launches. So I'm going to, in, so in that context, I'm going to take a particular look at human spaceflight because um, crude spaceflight, um, because um, because yes, it's quite heavy and it's quite questionable whether it's needed. Um, so here's a quick summary of the main um, organisations and launch vehicles involved in putting humans um, into space at the moment. Um, and with a summary of the propellants they use. So um, some like the uh, Russian Soyuz spacecraft are using um, refined kerosene um, with liquid oxygen. And you've got um, Elon Musk's SpaceX using, um, using a similar fuel combination. Um, Jeff Bezos' uh, new Blue Origin, the, the new Shepard spacecraft that uses liquid hydrogen. Um, and, and then you've got some more um, exotic fuels used by um, Virgin Galactic and the Chinese Space Agency. Um, and some of those have issues about um, toxic um, releases um, into the atmosphere. And then the biggest one of all, which we haven't, which hasn't been launched 
yet. Um, it's under development, but it's due for its first um, proper test launch next year. Um, is the space launch system of NASA, which is the rocket that's um, intended to take humans back to the moon. So, um, so those are the, the main main um, rockets around for human spaceflight at the moment, and, and what they they use. Um, to say a little bit more about Artemis, the um, program to take humans back to the moon. Um, it's not just a single space flight um, taking humans to the moon. There's all the preparatory missions and um, some with some with humans and some taking extra equipment up there. So um, you've got a diagram here. This is from NASA. Um, you can see that there are um, six space missions here. Um, to get humans to the moon by 2024, which is the target date for that. So, um, um, and each one being a heavy vehicle. Um, so here's some estimates in this table, there's some estimates of um, carbon emissions per launch and carbon emissions per person carried on um, the space um, launch vehicles that, that there is decent data with. And, and I should add, I, I've done these calculations using some um, data from um, Professor Mike Berners-Lee at Lancaster University in the UK. Um, and they are ballpark figures. Um, it's a complex area. Um, and these just give you an idea of, of the sort of carbon emissions that, that are, are emitted um, per launch. So um, you've got the Soyuz spacecraft, um, Russian spacecraft launching nearly th um, nearly 300 tonnes per launch, tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is the measure for um, carbon emissions. Um, three crews, so that's just under 100 emissions per person. Um, the SpaceX Falcon spaceship, that's about 500 tonnes per launch, um, has a larger crew, so um, a bit higher carbon emissions per person. And then you've got the space launch system of NASA, um, going to the moon, and that's considerably higher. So you've got um, three three thousand six hundred over um, three thousand over three thousand six hundred tons per launch, um, and that's over nine hundred tons per person carried. So um, very high. Um, and and then yes, we don't have data on on some of the others um, enough to give you an estimate. Um, we do know that the New Shepard um, Jeff Bezos's spacecraft is probably higher than, than SpaceX, whereas Virgin Galactic is probably significantly lower because it, it doesn't fly as high, doesn't actually get into outer space as internationally defined, which is um, um, <laughs> a subject of, of debate with various people in the, in the space tourism in industry. So military space flight, well, the emissions per launch are often similar. So, for example, Soyuz 2, um, that's a, a launch vehicle that will launch humans in space or launches humans in space, but it also launches military payloads into space. So you're looking at a similar payload. And then with the advent, particularly of the US Space Force, which was announced in 2019 by our, our friend Donald Trump, um, you've got a, a, the number of military flights set to increase and various other nations are interested in, in um, space flight as well. And you heard from Regina about the um, EU's um, growing interest in this area as well. The UK incidentally published its national space strategy um, this week and um, military, um, military uh, missions are very much um, considered part of that. And, and it's all justified by the, the um, apparent need to defend civilian activities. Um, but the potential for um, the possibility of weaponization in space is very real. Um, and if countries were serious about stopping that, then they, they could agree a treaty. Um, and there is a draft treaty in existence, the Paris Treaty, the prevention of an arms race in outer space uh, proposed by a number of countries, including Russia, um, but the US is, is opposed to that treaty, and so it has not been agreed yet. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, comparing space flights to what normal people do um, on the ground, um, well, as, I, as the data I showed you, one space tourist 
flight for a uh, space tourist flight for one person is about 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, the annual carbon footprint of a UK citizen is about 10 tonnes. So you've got um, a, a space tourism flight being 10 times or, or worth 10 humans, 10 um, UK humans for a year. Um, if we look at what's necessary to keep within um, emissions targets, we, we need to be thinking about two and a half tonnes per person um, per year. Um, and that's the target we need to get to by 2030. Um, so you can see the one space tourism flight is, is at least 40 people's worth. Um, so it begins, um, it, it just makes a mockery of, of attempting to try and get people to um, a low carbon lifestyle. Um, and so how do we convince people to change their lifestyles to um, stop flying or reduce their flying and, and, and minimize car use and, and cut their meat consumption? How do we do this when billionaires are traveling into space? Um, and it's another example Space tourism is another example of the huge global inequality of carbon emissions. And this graph here is, is taken from a report by Oxfam, which mapped the um, distribution of carbon emissions by, um, by wealth, by income. Um, so the richest 10% in the world emit nearly half the um, world's carbon emissions, whereas the poorest 50% emit 10% of the world's carbon emissions. So you see huge, huge inequality. And this graph actually has become known as the champagne glass graph because of its shape. Um, and, and it shows you that we really need to tackle, if we were going to tackle climate change, we need, really need to tackle the carbon emissions of the richest 10% um, of the world, um, and maybe 20%. Um, so yeah, so we have a climate emergency. I'm sure this hasn't escaped your attention. Um, the UN Secretary General said um, in a statement recently, this is code red for humanity, the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN's advisory body on this issue, um, published a report that, that said the global carbon budget for hitting the 1.5 temperature target will be exhausted at current rates in about 10 years time. Um, if we take fair shares and apply them across the world, then industrialized nations will have um, a much shorter time scale. And we recently published a blog on our website uh, showing that the UK's fair share will be used up in less than four years. So once you get beer, once you get to that, that level, you're, you're stealing, you're effectively stealing the carbon budget of poorer countries. So that's where we're heading, and particularly where we're heading if space tourism becomes um, you know, at all, um, significant in, in the global economy. So to conclude, minimising climate impacts, um, we need to take some serious action. We, we need a ban on space launches related to the weaponization of space. So we need a Paris Treaty in force. We need to minimise other military missions, um, particularly the, there are some military missions that have particularly values in, in terms of things like enforcing disarmament treaties. Those, those could be accepted, but most other military missions are, are very problematic and we need to minimise those. And then we need to minimise human spaceflight um, and, and a moratorium on space tourism and on human space missions to the moon and other celestial bodies. We, we really need to stop that, at least until we get to net zero. Um, and, and um, that's that's the target for the world by 2050. We'll see if we actually make it. But we should, if we're, if we're serious about tackling the climate emergency, um, that's what we should be doing. And um, and finally, just reducing robotic space missions to the essential program. So Earth observation and telecommunications and, and those particular areas. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Stuart. Um, that was really informative. Very excellent. Thanks. Uh, so we'll go on, move on to our final speaker, Dr. Dieter Engels, who's an astrophysicist um, from the University of Hamburg. Uh, his research areas are stellar mazes and late, late stages of stellar evolution. He's a member of the German, I'm not sure I can say it in German, but in English, it's... Um, 
of the German Association of Natural Scientists for Peace and Sustainability. Um, and he's committed to promoting the use of space only for civil purposes. So thanks very much for joining us, uh, Dieter, and over to you now. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me to talk here. Um, I'm an astronomer, and I was asked to uh, say a few words about uh, what the new satellite constellations, which are built up for communications and maybe also for remote sensing, will have uh, on the, the astronomical observations. The, the picture you are seeing here, let me go into the full presentation, uh, is the trace uh, of the Starlink the satellites. That is uh, one of the constellations which the company SpaceX is currently building up. And uh, such pictures with this chain of, um, of satellites, these are the strikes here uh, in front of the background of stars. Uh, this alerted the astronomers and they, they started to ask if uh, these uh, trails on the sky would uh, inhibit uh, astronomical observations in the future. The problem imposed by these uh, new satellites is a problem which uh, is um, also, well, it is, it is not new. Even we're starting with the Sputnik satellite, uh, trails of satellites have been seen on, uh, on astronomical images, as well as, uh, for example, meteorites make also trails on astronomical um, images. And so uh, the, the problem as such is not new. Where it first started was uh, in the radio domain and uh, not in the optical one where you usually associate uh, astronomy with. What you see here in this graph is the electromagnetic spectrum starting from a nano a nanometer up to about one kilometer. And uh, what you see in the upper panel is the atmospheric op opacity. So the atmosphere is uh, mostly opaque to the radiation which comes from space. And there are largely only two windows where we can observe from Earth. That's the optical uh, window uh, around uh, a bit less than uh, one micrometer. And then there's a larger window uh, at uh, wavelengths between uh, about one centimeter to 10 meters, where you can observe uh, with uh, radio telescopes radiation, uh, which uh, comes from space. In the radio domain, there are, however, a lot of other users not from only from space, but also from ground, which are using these waves and which in principle disturb um, our observations. So what you are seeing here is a map of the frequency allocations from the United States, showing all the services which share the radio astronomical band that starts from meter wavelengths up here in the upper left and goes down to a millimeter wavelengths down here in the right corner. You don't, don't see the details. There are so many services sharing the spectrum that a very sophisticated um, management is needed to uh, satisfy all the needs which these services ha have. Here in the left corner, I made a cutout uh, around the frequency of around 1,600 to 1,700 megahertz. This is about 18 centimeter in wavelengths. And you see this yellow portions here in uh, this cutout. These are the bands which are protected for, um, uh, for the radio astronomy. The, at these bands, there's one important molecule, the uh, 
OH molecule, which can be observed on Earth. And um, for not to interfere with these observations, these bands cannot be used actively by other services. There are services which can passively use this band, but it's not allowed uh, to active use uh, of these narrow bandwidths. Um, the usual problem we have in radio astronomy is that in the neighboring bands, where the civil, uh, where, where the services use, they're much stronger emitters. They often the filters are not good enough. Uh, that are spill over to to the protected radio astronomy bands uh, is uh, inhibited. So there's a constant fight to have these uh, windows in frequency or, or wavelengths clean. An example is, for example, a civilian satellite. It's called CloudSat. It's a NASA satellite, which is using a radar to measure the altitude and the properties of the clouds on our Earth. It's an important measurement, which is done and used also for uh, understanding the changes, uh, the climate-induced changes in our atmosphere. The problem for the astronomers is that the downlink of the radar, which is here, uh, is uh, emitting at uh, 94 gigahertz. This is a, a millimeter wavelengths. And uh, it's um, in former times, uh, there were no uh, radio, there were no um, microwave services in this range. So uh, the astronomers had a clear sky and um, the <clears throat> our technical civilization is more and more using the higher frequencies, meaning the smaller wavelengths. And so uh, more and more conflicts uh, are have arisen with the astronomical uh, community. It goes so far that if uh, the uh, satellite uh, beams downwards to Earth and at the same moment the antenna of the observatory is aligned to the satellite, this would destroy our receivers. So uh, this was uh, um, noticed by the astronomers uh, in a very late stage when the when the uh, satellite was already uh, close to start and so there had been some some negotiations with nasa to avoid uh, damaging the receivers but at the end uh, the situation is that the it's the responsibilities of the observatories to be sure that there's no uh, satellite with uh, emissions, um, down, uh, downlink emissions, which could uh, damage the receivers. Uh, so what the astronomers learned from this, uh, from this and others similar events is that they have uh, to, um, to participate in the conferences where the the um, radio spectrum is divided into the different services to be sure that uh, <clears throat> the needs of the astronomers are not affected. Another part, uh, what uh, now moving to the optical uh, domain, is that uh, we already from from the ground based lights, uh, the sky is brightened. For example, this is a, a, a picture taken about 90 miles away from Los Angeles, looking toward Los Angeles. You see the city lights, and the city lights illuminate the clouds, but also the night sky in the background uh, by, the, by the tiny particles, which, are, uh, um, which, which you do not see optically, but which also reflect the light from, from the cities. The front, you see also the trail from from uh, from a highway, and uh, this uh, kind of light pollution is uh, this is a constantly uh, a constant problem, and um, for us it means that if the sky gets too bright, we are not able to observe the very faint and also the very oh, excuse me and the very, uh, very distant stars and galaxies. So the remedy was already 
started already 20, 25 years ago, that the observatories moved from the, from the places where many people lived to remote places in, like deserts in Chile, mountains in Hawaii or in Tibet. Uh, the pollution by satellites or by space is uh, likewise uh, small. Uh, the pollution comes from solar light, which is reflected by satellites, as it is uh, by the moon. And if the moon is up, we, it's difficult for us to observe. But also if there are too many satellites, uh, it, is, it will be difficult uh, to continue the observations with the same quality we are used to. And uh, while we noticed these problems very early, we're on trails of optical survey images. And uh, you see here two examples from a paper submitted in uh, 1992, uh, where you see on the left-hand side uh, an exposure on a photographic plate. T uh, the integration time was about one hour. And you see five trays of five satellites crossing this uh, photograph. That's a um, it's an extreme case. Usually, this uh, you would see one trail, and uh, this does not happen very frequently with the uh, satellites we have up to now. But in uh, bad circumstances, it could be that the trail really hits the target which you are uh, looking at. Uh, the rings which you see here are the light echoes of a supernova of an exploding star. Uh, which was uh, sought, uh, was wanted to be studied here. But in this case, well, you are, uh, <clears throat> you can repeat the observation. You need to invest another hour on the telescope to re redo the observation. So the damage is quite limited. But what happens if we have uh, satellites all over the, over the sky? So, uh, with the communication satellites, uh, up to now, uh, they were large satellites stationed at uh, 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 geo orbit, uh, 36,000 kilometers away from Earth. And uh, they are staring at a given place on, on Earth. And so that you can communicate with the satellite without moving your antenna or moving your uh, the satellite. But the, the backlash is that it takes some time for the signal to arrive the satellite and to come back. And so uh, the new con uh, constellations with small satellites uh, promise uh, to have a lower latency. So the response time is uh, much shorter and that will be very helpful, for example, for the communication uh, with uh, uh, of, of, of things uh, between uh, between different uh, technical um, technical things uh, which uh, communicate without interference of, of humans. And uh, the, there are a lot of companies and also uh, uh, countries like China which are projecting such constellations. And uh, what is already known is that there will be about 80,000 satellites planned and uh, launched are only a few of them. Um, but <clears throat> we started, uh, there has a study has been done to find out um, what the impact would be if we have uh, like 80,000 satellites on the sky. The problem is that when the observatory is observing into the night sky, there's still some part which uh, uh, there are satellites which are illuminated by the sun, which is uh, going down. And uh, if, are these uh, satellites which are not in the shadow of the Earth, which make the problem? <clears throat> in this uh, simulation year, which was done by the European Southern Observatory, ESO, not ESA, ESO, uh, you see here. Uh, a model which was using 48,000 satellites. That's what we expect to companies or countries. And in Chile, 
one would see at any time about 2,000 of these satellites. Here now they are all illuminated, and when the sun goes down, then in the east, these are the gray ones, are uh, getting dark. So, uh, what what is important in the in the in the central part here at high uh, latitudes, there are only 200 of, uh, um, satellites at a time, and uh, at the end of the twilight. Uh, there are only 10 of these satellites which are still be seen by, by the naked eye. So the conclusion from this study was that for the ESO te telescopes, uh, uh, this problem will be manageable uh, for the forthcoming 10 years. <clears throat> there are possible for mitigations. You can, for example, paint the, uh, the satellite in dark with a black uh, color. You can equip the satellites with a shield to avoid the reflecting light to go to Earth. And you can also optimize the attitude of the satellites so that the sun shields don't uh, reflect their light uh, towards Earth. All this has been tested by SpaceX and the effects are around, uh, you can decrease the illuminance of the uh, satellites by about 50%, I would say. But that would be not enough to, uh, especially if there are more satellites. So there were activities by the International Astronomical Union to make some uh, recommendations how these uh, satellites constellations should be constructed. For example, giving limitations on the orbital height, on the brightness of the satellites, and uh, this was submitted to the to the to the Scopus body, which uh, discusses uh, problems in space. But um, the EO also thinks that natural national regulations are unnecessary. <clears throat> so, what's the outlook? Uh, the outlook is that although it's uh, pro uh, at the pro at the moment, it seems to be manageable the problem. In future, uh, it may the problem may increase. It's because the modern astronomy is uh, very interested in very short time uh, processes like gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts, which are the signs of merging black holes or Newton stars. And to understand what's happening there, or where these uh, bursts occur, you, you need parallel optical observer observing to see what stars are it or are it in galaxies, for example. And for this, you need uh, continuous monitoring of the optical sky, how it is planned with the new US observatory in Chile, which is imaging the entire visible sky every few nights. And uh, there, the impact of satellite, uh, satellite trials will uh, likely increase or aggravate. So the conclusion is for astronomy, uh, the preservation of the access for the night sky as for the Earth's culture at, uh, at, at large, it is still a continuing struggle and will accompany us uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dieter. <coughs> and uh, now it's your turn for questions uh, and answers. And I see some questions already in the chat, but I'm going to hand over to Bruce Gagnon, who's a coordinator at the Global Network, um, who will take, you, take us through this session. Over to you, Bruce. All right. Well, uh, thank you to all the presenters. I think I learned quite a bit here. That uh, So I uh, really much appreciate uh, your contributions. And thank you for those that have uh, joined the webinar. I hope that you too feel like you've learned something. I want to just go to each of the speakers and ask a, a question or two. Dave, I want to start with you. Um, why do you think so many spaceports, we've seen a, just a, a rash of uh, proposals and new, new uh, uh, construction of spaceports all over the world. Why do you think there are so many being developed? Well, I think that one of the reasons certainly is um, that it's been predicted that the space business will be worth over a trillion dollars uh, in maybe as short a time as 2030 or 2040. 
And there's a lot of people want to cash in on that. And this, the, the kind of business is moving towards mini satellites, very small satellites that can be launched relatively easily into low orbit, uh, low Earth orbit. And um, many of the spaceports that we're seeing being developed are that for that specific purpose, I think. So, you know, a lot of people, the UK, for example, wants to cash in on it, it said it explicitly, the government wants to be part of that. Um, and it's even suggesting that it may help the economy from re returning after the COVID experience. So I guess a lot of other governments are thinking much the same. Thank you. Uh, Regina, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think that uh, the public in Europe, throughout Europe, are, are aware and concerned about this growing militarization of space? And do you see any sign of groups emerging, either new groups or existing groups that are incorporating this concern into their work? Do you see, uh, could you give us your reflection on that, please? Well, I'm afraid that the simple question is no. When you ask whether people are aware, I guess uh, I can speak only for Germany because I don't follow the media in other countries. Uh, but here in Germany, I guess uh, most people are not at all aware of this. Uh, I, I called it a slippery slope uh, towards the military use of space 20 years ago at the first global network conference I attended. Um, and even within the peace movement or the peace groups, I don't think that people really are aware. There are very, very few people working on this in Germany. And most of them come from think tanks, and some of them are um, very close to, to governmental thinking. Um, and I think that the awareness of uh, the tendency of the European Union to go military um, is increasing, but not when it comes to space. Um, if I had a clue how to change this, I would do it, Bruce. Um, I'm frustrated at this uh, myself, but I don't really see how we can create an awareness not to speak of a movement against this development. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, kind of a similar question for you. Uh, do you think most environmental groups uh, working on climate crisis are looking at these impacts that you outlined uh, d that uh, will be increasingly so uh, due to uh, more space launches. Thanks, Bruce. Um, no, I don't. I, th I think they aren't aware of it, the problem, and um, it's partly due to a simpler lack of data, um, and there's very little research out there. I, I tried, for my talk, I tried to find some decent data and in the end um, there's one book that I found that referenced it on two pages um, a, um, and a book by a colleague um, here in Lancaster um, and pretty much nowhere else and then I used his work to do a few more calculations which I presented tonight. Um, so I think that that's a key issue is starting to explain to people why it's a problem. And um, I think there's an awareness now that there, there's sort of a bit of, you know, that, that there's the sort of initial excitement, oh, space tourism, we can all go into space now and, and with the launches over the past year. Um, but I also think that that's tempered by, oh, it's just the billionaires then. And, and it's another jolly for them. And I think that's, um, that's increasingly seen as a reflection of the inequality in the world. So I think that that's, there's some resentment there that we could um, um, tap into. But I think once, once we start to um, get this information out there about how bad, how polluting space, um, space flights are, we, we can start to get some change going. I mean, there's another example, um, um, recently, one of the big environmental groups in the, in the UK was using Tim Peake, who was um, a UK astronaut, um, as part of their campaigning around um, climate 
um, change, action on climate change. And I, I pointed out to them, <laughs> why are you doing this? This is one of the most polluting jobs in the world. Um, and I didn't get an answer to my question, although I've noticed um, in the couple of years since he's, he's not been involved. So hopefully I had an effect. But now that I can present some data, um, hopefully this, this issue will become um, more critically assessed. And I'm trying to get it to a few journalists, but it, it's hard. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of starry eyed, um, if forgive the pun, in the attitude of of a lot of um, of a lot of scientists and a lot of journalists in this area, they just think, "Oh, space is exciting," um, without seeing what the costs are and, and the the dark side of it, the military side of it, the the pollution side of it. Um, and so we need to get that message out much more. Good, thank you very much, uh, Dieter. Let me ask you a question, please. Um, are astronomers around the world currently organizing? to stop or to regulate uh, the numbers of space launches. And in addition to that, a second part to this question, are many other disciplines or professions joining astronomers in your concerns? Are, are, you, know, are you finding solidarity from others uh, with your concerns? The, quest, the first question is uh, no. Uh, our influence is too small that we are able to influence the decisions of the space companies. Um, the second, uh, so we, we try to live and to circumvent the, uh, um, <clears throat> the problems, or uh, we directly contact the, the space uh, companies to, so that they design their constellations in a way that the impact on astronomy is minimized. Um, your second question was this, uh, our problems with this uh, satellites is uh, so specialized that there are, um, there are up to now no other, um, no other uh, parts of science which, uh, which raised their voice in, in any way. And any, they didn't say that they have a concern with that. All right, thanks. Something, something that needs some work. Uh, yeah, but it's very new, this problem, you know, it started only two years ago. So it's uh, not even the public is really aware of uh, that that might become a problem for the astronomy and the, uh, space companies itself, they don't want uh, bad press, so they are very interested to uh, get rid of this problem with the, with the astronomers, so they are very cooperative. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear. Um, uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Shmuel uh, has a question. Uh, any, anybody can jump in to answer this if you'd like. He wants to know, if I understand it correctly, can the increase of civilian use of space, non-military use, help reduce the negative impacts of climate crisis? Stuart, maybe you or anyone else wants to answer that. Yeah, I mean, the, this is what one of the issues that I was trying to get at to get at when I was talking about essential versus non-essential use of space. I think that there's a very valuable role of space in Earth observation satellites and monitoring climate change, monitoring concentrations of greenhouse gases, monitoring land use change, oceans, um, ocean temperatures, surface temperatures. So that's very valuable and we need that. We absolutely need that. And that's worth, um, that's worth the um, carbon impacts of the satellite launches. But the rest of it, it becomes increasingly difficult to justify and particularly over the short term when we are trying to get large changes in society. And, and for the for governments to say, oh, look, big, big potential for expansion into space right now is it, just the wrong thing. We, we need some of it's useful, but most of it, um, certainly the, the stuff around space tourism and, and the militarization, it, it's just really problematic. Thank you. Anybody else want to say anything on that question? Go ahead, Regina. Well, I observe that the uh, key players, the key space players or the, 
key players in spaceflight uh, tend to duplicate and triplicate efforts a lot. So uh, the European Union is doing their own navigational satellite system, while a US, a Russian, and a Chinese system already exist. Navigational systems are very important for military purposes. So I understand the strategic rationale of duplicating these satellites, although I don't agree with, with that, uh, but I understand the rationale. Whereas when it comes to Earth observation, I do see that, uh, for example, some of the Copernicus satellites are very modern, are very sophisticated, but very, with very advanced technology. But is it really necessary to duplicate uh, satellites the US uh, has already in space or other uh, uh, spacefaring nations might do? Um, at least when it comes to, to that, uh, I would urge that there be more cooperation, uh, even more so that a lot of the data are actually use, uh, free for use by anyone, by by scientists, by um, journalists, by governments, by whoever. Um, so I think um, there should be more joint uh, space projects when it comes to Earth observation. Go ahead, Dieter. You're, mu you're muted. I have one question to Stuart. Uh, in the uh, for the flights, there are discussions about uh, creating synthetic fuels to uh, to avoid the uh, the carbon emissions. Are you aware of any discussions to replace the the, um, the fuel for the rockets uh, with synthetic fuels? Is that the second question? Is or a comment to Regina. Uh, in astronomy, we have uh, a cooperation between the different space agencies where uh, the different observatories, which we need for X-rays, for example, which you can, where you can observe only from space, they are, um, they are built one after another by the different space agencies. So one, at one, uh, at one time it's NASA, which is building one, then 20 years later it's ESA, then YAXA from Japan and all astronomers all over the world are uh, allowed to uh, observe with these uh, satellites. So there's already this kind of cooperation, which uh, you were talking about, Regina. So that would be a good example how one could organize that. But at the moment, as long uh, there's some interest to earn some money with it, or there are some, some uh, space security issues involved, then this kind of cooperation does not happen. Stuart, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was, uh, um, was going to comment on something Regina said and, and also reply to Dieter's points. Um, just about duplication in, in Earth's observation, one of the problems we've had um, recently was Donald Trump just started cancelling um, NASA projects that were Earth observation, anything climate related. He said it, it's political and um, I don't agree with it and started cancelling them. And that has been a real problem for Earth observation stuff and climate related research. And that suddenly you're starting to lose essential data. Um, so that's so Europe has been arguably in the lead in trying to fill the gap. So I th and I think increasingly that's going to be the case, and and so the U.S. will do it when the president lets them, but the the Europeans will, will have to step in because they they're not so subject to that that sort of um, problem. Um, in reply to Dieter on, on synthetic fuels, um, yes, there's a there's growing research in this area, and the military is one of the people who are getting interested in this area because they they want it for their jet fighters um, and and for their warships so um, but yeah it's at a very early stage there are there are various problems um, with the, um, the research and the practicality and some of the issues um, particularly in things like what, what's called sustainable aviation fuels which are um, another word for biofuels is the competition for the resources we 
Um, if you, um, for, so biofuels, the big problem is if you get them from energy crops, then you're competing with food. Um, and sometimes, depending on the bio, by, uh, the energy crop, it can be more carbon emissions than, than um, fossil fuels. Then you've got the issues of, okay, we'll use waste um, um, biofuel, um, biofuels made from waste, vegetable oils, for example. But the problem there is there's not that much waste to cope with all, all the uses that we've got. We've got demands from, from um, the automotive sector, so cars, we've got demands from the civil aviation sector, and, and then the space sector, then the military sector, and, and there's just not enough waste oil to go around. So it, it's, um, so there are a lot of problems there um, that need to be solved and, and um, uh, not much time to sort them out. Let me just say there's a lot of really good uh, comments. If people are not watching, following the chat, please take a look at it. There's a lot of good things uh, being said inside the chat. But Regina, you had your hand up. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left, so please keep your answers short. I want to get back to Dave on another question as soon as possible. Go ahead, Regina. Well, I, I wonder whether one, one of the reasons for uh, a lack of, of cooperation is uh, what I stressed uh, with regards to the European Union, that they enforce dual use uh, of technology. And of course, when, they, when the satellites and when the technology on satellites you use is dual use and also used for military, you want your own stuff and, and, and not depend on others. Uh, so I think uh, this whole, in, in many technological areas, this whole increase of dual use using civilian technology for military purposes uh, is really uh, a bad development. All right, Dave, there's a question about the uh, UN space treaties. A uh, person was asking, uh, is there, uh, are there treaties that ban a lot of these things, particularly militarization? Can you briefly discuss those two treaties? Yeah, there is no treaty that, that bans the use of uh, space by the military, uh, although there have been attempts to make um, treaties in the, at the UN. Uh, Russia and China in particular put forward a, a treaty every year for the PAROS, for the prevention of an arms race in outer space, to help to at least um, perhaps minimise the amount of uh, use of, of the military and to prevent further escalation. But that's not, uh, I think that's already been said, that's not agreed by the United States. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty is, has, a, has a really good, strong spirit, a human spirit, which is really important, but it's being slowly eroded as people are taking less and less notice of it. And uh, especially with the big corporations who now want to go out and mine the, the planets and mine the asteroids and do all kinds of things, build moon bases, etc. Uh, it's all being kind of more or less bypassed. We really need a much stronger outer space treaty with really firm commitments on spacefaring nations to really abide by the uh, the notions of um, the the space being free and you being able to be used by everybody. I'd like to uh, ask anybody that wants to answer this question uh, about the growing problem of space debris or space junk. Uh, you know, the, the Kessler syndrome that says that uh, once at a certain point, we're gonna have this cascading effect where things start smashing into each other. Uh, so uh, is, isn't this a huge concern for all of us? Because much of what we do on the earth will go dark if we have this kind of uh, a massive cascading effect with space debris and knocking out satellites. Uh, any comments on that from any of you? Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have much to add, but you're absolutely right. This is a key issue. And um, yeah, you, you get um, some ill, um, ill-disciplined um, company, organization, agency, um, putting um, a satellite in space that explodes and puts debris into orbit and then starts smashing um, 
satellites that then um, explode and smash other satellites. So it, we could be in a very serious situation if that starts to happen. We, we need regulation of outer space in so many ways very, very quickly. Uh, go ahead, Regina, and then Dave. Well, and I also observe that um, in some countries, uh, they work on the development of technology to capture space debris in space uh, to send up, I don't know, like big satellite arms that would, that would collect debris or uh, to vaporize it with lasers and so on. And I again see a, a high potential of military use of all that technology, like uh, when you when you come close to other satellites, uh, it's a question of whether you want to be friendly or kick it out of its orbit and so on. Um, so I think the first priority should, uh, as Stuart pointed out, uh, be to avoid debris. And in debris mitigation, there is an urgent need again for cooperation among, among the various blocks. Uh, that China and Russia and the United States and, and the European Union work together rather than each doing their own thing so that the others don't really know what they do, what, what technology they use and what, what their intentions are. Okay, Dave. Yeah, well, I think Regina made the point I was going to make. Uh, just to add also, though, uh, <clears throat> there are collisions happening with, uh, between satellites that have happened already. And the more you put up, the more likely a collision is to occur. Uh, and um, also people are starting to, to produce satellites that maneuver in space, whereas previously they've just stayed in one particular orbit. Now they're actually moving them around to perhaps inspect other satellites or do whatever. And that's also, of course, very dangerous, especially if you don't tell other nations what your satellites are doing. So. Yeah, there's so much need for cooperation and, and talking about space that, uh, that isn't happening at the moment. I'd like to uh, just kind of close with a couple comments. One is that we just learned this morning that a representative Huffman from California in the United States has introduced legislation that is being sponsored by several other uh, representatives in the House of Representatives to defund the Space Force. Uh, that's a good uh, development for us, gives us something to work around, to build around, to educate around. It's not likely to pass. We must remember that it was the Democratic Party that controls the House during Trump that voted in favor, that uh, made it happen, the Space Force. So, but anyway, it's a good development, especially during Keep Space for Peace Week. We see that someone's paying a little bit of attention. Um, it is hard to get the public to focus on space issues. Uh, one commenter here in the chat said that the, the public knows more than we realize, but is cynical or in a way in denial. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, the fact that we only had a, a couple handfuls of people on this webinar today indicates that it's a tough issue to get people interested in and involved in. It's out there, it's far away, it's in the future, you know, all those kind of reasons. But uh, it's work that we have to keep doing. And, and I'm proud of the, of the work and the membership of the Global Network and everybody that's really giving their life to it. One of our board members, Dr. Aruna Kamila, is a law professor in India. She's organizing, she's on this, this uh, call today listening, and uh, she's organizing a webinar uh, later next week. She's a law professor, organized a space law conference from our perspective uh, at, a, at a law school and had people come from 20 different law schools all over India, students, faculty, uh, talking about the need for space law to uh, not destroy the, the heavens. So there are some really great things happening that, uh, that we're very excited about. Um, Dave, you want to make any closing comment before we go? I oh, know, just thanks to all the speakers. I, I, I'm hoping that maybe more people will get start to take an interest and get more involved if, um, if they see this particular um, recording uh, which we will put on the website and and please share the the, the link to it so
thanks to everyone who did come. I think we may get more where we're kind of repeating or doing a similar webinar again later in the week at a different sort of time. Maybe we'll get more people to that too. All right, well, thank you everybody very much. We appreciate it and uh, good luck. And as I like to say, get organized. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>